specialising in remote sensing and geographic information systems. And Bethany's research is focused on identifying new applications for spatial technologies and techniques. Thank you. I think I'll be able to click, Jim. Yeah. Okay. And cool. lights. Yes, it just helps a bit. Sure. Okay, um, well, hello everyone. Um, so as Dawn said, my name is Bethany um, and I am from UTAS. Um, so today I am not actually going to talk about research. I am going to talk about teaching and how we use open source software to kind of train people to become more competent um, and more employable analysts. So I want to start with a somewhat silly example that we very commonly see when we're actually trying to teach people how to do these jobs. So imagine that you are a freshly minted graduate coming out of university um, and you have decided that you would like to learn how to make tables. And that's the one thing that you would really like to do with your life and you've spent all of these years learning how to do these and how to build them, these lovely tables. And then now you've gotten your very first job ever at your local table shop. So what happens is you rock up on your first day and you're very, very excited. You've got all of these wonderful ideas about all of the beautiful things that you can build and all of these very elaborate and ornately carved um, tables that you imagine just being in the halls of kings and all those sorts of things. But then your boss comes up to you and goes, no, 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 no. We can't do that. That's way too expensive. We don't have the resources. We don't have the time. What we want from you is we want you to build something much more simple. So you guys head downstairs and he shows you this table here. And he says, okay, what you're gonna be doing is you're going to be putting together these types of tables here. And you're like, oh, well, okay. That seems probably like it's fine. You know, it's not exactly what I wanted to be doing with my life, but I have seen these types of tables before. And I spent a lot of time at university learning how to put them together. So the good thing about these types of tables as you've seen at university is that they're very simple to put together and there are very, very predefined kind of tools that you use to build them. So these tables are really modular. They have all these parts that fit together in very specific ways. You always have the same process and the same instructions every time you try and work on them. You know exactly what type of screws go into which parts and how to get everything together into this repeatable and reliable format. So you spend a couple of years working as a junior table maker and you put together hundreds if not thousands of these tables. And over time, you become really, really confident and you feel like you've become an excellent table maker until one day, um, your boss will come up to you and he says, look, I'm really, really sorry, um, but we can't get those kits that we used to get anymore. So I'm going to have to go to a new supplier and I'm going to have to get some new things for you to build tables with. And you think, oh, okay, no, that's fine. I've built all these tables so many times before I can handle this. And then you go down into the basement and all you see is this pile of logs and your boss goes, Okay, get cracking, make this table for me, please. And then you go, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I've never seen this before. I don't know how to cut the bits of wood out. I don't know what tools to use. I don't know what screws. I don't know what glue. And you just panic. And this happens all the time when we get graduates, when they come out of university. <laughs> Is that we spend all this time teaching them how to use very, very specific software programs and how to build GIS or remote sensing workflows that are really highly modulized in this way. And we train them very specifically to follow instructions. And then when they get thrown into the real world where they don't have that safety net, they panic and they don't know what to do. So this leads us to the title of our presentation, which is how to stop training button clickers. So button clickers, um, I think the best example would be if you think about your grandma trying to send you an email. So grandma's probably memorized exactly where all the buttons she needs um, to send an email are in the software. She can open the internet. She knows what the internet logo looks like. She knows how to type in www.gmail.com and how to log in and how to click the new message button. And you get lovely emails from your grandma all the time. But what happens when Gmail has an update and things move slightly or maybe um, Chrome redesigns their logo? Poor grandma just can't handle it. And she doesn't know what to do and you no longer get any emails from her. So that's what we call a button clicker. So a button clicker is a student or an analyst that's basically just memorized by rote learning the exact steps and the exact buttons that they need to click in a software package to get the results that they need. And for a lot of people, this is how they operate when they um, have jobs as special analysts. They don't have that flexibility in their thinking to kind of move outside that memorization process. So ideally what we want to do 
Um, and so we want to look at the types of people that tend to come into this field. This is a theory that I've had for a number of years that I've been kind of mulling around in my head, is that there are basically three types of people that we commonly see in the spatial sciences and in spatial sciences careers. The first person um, is what I call the applications-based analyst. So this is someone that has typically come to spatial sciences from another background or from another discipline. So people coming from things like oceanic sciences, urban planning, um, environmental management, all those sorts of things. And these people have a lot of really, really good skills that make them good GIS and remote sensing analysts. Because they come from another discipline, they have really good background information that could help them to contextualize what they're doing um, in their spatial analysis. Where these people tend to be a bit weaker is that they don't have a very strong technical ability. So they have trouble moving past the initial ideas that they're taught and the initial kind of workflows and ways of handling data. So I would say that this type of analyst is a type of analyst that's most likely to become a typical button clicker. The second, <laughs> the second type um, of analyst that we see commonly is what I call the technical wizard. So these are people that have exceptionally strong technical skills and they may be coming from backgrounds like mathematics, physics, computer science, all those sorts of things. So they have the ability to build these systems and to build these workflows um, that are very, very complicated um, and they have very strong technical, technical knowledge. Where this kind of falls over for these people a lot of the time is the strength that the application-based analyst tends to have. So that means that often it's very difficult for these people to apply their knowledge in a real world kind of situation and to make connections about what they're doing. So in the ideal world, both of these analysts are very common um, and they both are, can be very, very successful in the spatial field. But what I think um, we need to be trying to do more of in the education sector is trying to build what I call the hybrid, um, which is the person that sits in between these two main camps in terms of skill sets. So the hybrid is a somewhat mythical and rare creature, um, and most people tend to fall quite firmly into either the applications or the technical side. And it can be really, really difficult to train people to kind of sit in that middle ground because you need someone who has a very, very flexible way of thinking. And you need someone um, who is interested enough to put in the time to build up the skill set from the other side of the spectrum that they're on. What I've noticed more and more is that we know that our sector is undergoing a really rapid period of growth, and we're seeing a lot more people coming into our sector, particularly from the application side, um, where many disciplines are realizing the value that spatial sciences can have for them. And they're coming in, teaching themselves a lot of the time, and not building up that technical knowledge. Okay, no, I thought it turned off for a second, but it didn't. So one of the main drivers, I think, behind this kind of phenomenon that we're seeing, where people are becoming more and more entrenched in this button clicking way of doing things, is the way that many modern proprietary software programs are actually built. So we've seen a very strong rise in what I call the, well, not just me, other people, um, called the plug and play mode um, of software development. This is very, very common in the UAV community in particular, where you have these systems where you can upload all your data and allegedly it will mosaic it and process it and do all of these things and give you magical outputs that you can do everything imaginable with. This, in theory, is a really, really powerful thing and a really, really good idea. But where it falls over is that a lot of the time people relying on these platforms and using them don't have the technical knowledge or the training to actually properly understand what's coming out. So what that means is they can't necessarily interpret the results properly. And they're more prone to making incorrect assumptions, um, over-promising clients, um, or failing to notice when there's errors in their data sets. We also have um, an increase in what I call black, book, black box algorithms, which is where software um, tend to kind of wrap up their algorithms behind a user interface. So when you actually use the software, basically what you see is the bits that go in and maybe a couple of settings, but you don't ever actually get to see the insides of what's going on. You don't get to see how the algorithm works and the various, excuse me, steps that might be going into the process. We also have modularization, which is where we're kind of wrapping up all of our tools into these neat little packages. So then people can just learn that, you know, I need to hydrologically process a DEM, for example. So I go to the hydrology tool, I'm going to use this tool, this tool, and this tool. And there's no real understanding of why we do things in that order and why those tools are important and how to actually go in and kind of solve problems using that package. So 
what does all of this have to do with open source software? So I think that open source software and spatial programming are really, really important things that we need to be exposing people to earlier in their careers than we do a lot of the time. So the main advantages of open source software and spatial programming are that they basically overcome a lot of those limitations that I've just talked about that we see in proprietary programs. So we do, they allow students to kind of have a bit more of an understanding of the algorithms. So at all the individual steps that they're going through to produce that product. They also give students access to the data structures that are underlying their analysis in a more hands-on way. So they actually get to see all of the numbers within an array rather than just colored in little cells, for example. But the most important thing that I think that these alternatives use is that they give students the ability to debug. Because they can see the inside and they can see those data structures, they now have the opportunity to dig through and actually try and figure out exactly what's going on and why. I'm sure many of you have seen the dreaded 99999 error that you get in that JS. <coughs> that's just the error code that says something's gone wrong, that's all. When you, that, that's all it says, it's just error. <laughs> but when you're using something like Python um, or another programming language, you get a much more detailed printout. You can look at things like data types um, and where exactly in your processing those steps are falling through. So, surely, open source software is just the solution to this whole problem. All we need to do is we need to teach students how to program. As soon as they start university, you need to show them all of these open source things, get them right into the maths of things and keep going. Surely that will fix all of our problems. No. <laughs> and there are a number of reasons for this. While all of the things I've talked about, about exposing students to these things have a lot of value, what we do find is that students are absolutely terrified of them. So there's a reason why these proprietary software packages are industry standards and the standards that we teach in university. And that's that they provide a certain level of comfort to people. When you're first starting out, it's a lot easier to kind of go through those motions and just memorize those steps. Um, so, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to thought. Um, yeah, so there's a reason why they do that. And what we find is that when we expose students to these things too early and without an appropriate level of scaffolding, Students just straight up drop out of units. They don't complete them. They basically see things and they go, this is too hard. I can't do programming. There's too much math and this, and then they go. And that leads to really rough attrition, particularly at intermediate and advanced levels in these units. So how do we overcome that? So how do we expose students to the things that they need to be seeing without actually overwhelming them? And I think the way to do that is to borrow an idea from psychology um, with an idea called exposure therapy. <laughs> so exposure therapy um, is basically a concept where you very gradually and very friendly expose someone to something that they're afraid of, like rabbits, as we see in this example, until eventually they realize that the rabbit's not gonna hurt them and that you know if they have to open that raster in Python, they're not gonna explode and die. So this is something that I think we need to look at more in education, is how can we incorporate programming, open source software into units without scaring them off. We need to make sure that we scaffold students in a really supportive way. So not necessarily expecting them to be able to use all of these things right off, but at least showing them how the same process works between different software packages. Another good thing that we can do is we can look more at problem-based learning approaches. So we can make sure that students, um, after they've had an appropriate period of scaffolded learning, we remove some of those safety nets, but still in a fairly supportive environment, and say, look, here's a problem, you're going to solve it, these are the tools you're going to use, do it. That's one of the most effective ways that we have for teaching students how to do things, but it is important that they still feel supported while they're in university. And finally, the way that we teach needs to be more agnostic of the software platform that we're using. So we need to make sure that students aren't just seeing one software package throughout their university careers. So in conclusion, when we teach people, we need to make sure that we're teaching people a diverse array of techniques. This isn't just um, so that they can put on their resume, you know, I've seen QGIS, please hire me. It's so that they can build those thought processes and they can build those analysis skills that make them really, really flexible in the way that they're thinking and that they can adapt if suddenly they're thrown a software package or an analysis workflow they've never seen before. Um, and the, the last thing I wanna say is that 
While I've talked about the hybrid analysis, so the person with technical and applications-based skills as being kind of the holy grail of the remote sensing or GIS analyst, there's no kind of wrong way to be an analyst. I think that even if you're from applications or you're from technology, there's still many skills that people from both camps can learn between each other. And that's also something that we need to take into account in our education. So that is my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, sounds like you've got it really worked out. So have you had any success with the new method? Well, I actually started teaching this year. So, <laughs> so I've done some teaching. So you'll be back next year reporting. Yeah, next year I'll be back and I'll tell you exactly how wonderful I am and how I've made the best analysts ever. Well, actually, then I didn't have any success with that because, um, right. so in tank, we have search three, search four, and associates for the courses. And I was just saying that I encapsulated in a whisper to the big set three students come out from the oh, yes. And they explained to every young person to give them three. They are a mm -hmm. So they are not capable of the independent course where I described it. Set four students are capable of it, but don't like it. So their assessments are uh, designed to uh, make them look outside the teaching resources that we give them, but they don't. They tend to uh, still feel very comfortable in the teaching resources they've been provided with. Associates of firm students are forced to do it because we don't give them sufficient resources. They get to give them a task, they have to research our site. But what industry, uh, so every three years we get, uh, our courses are assessed, and every three years industry provides feedback on the students that we have generated with our into industry. And mm. their feedback was that our students do not have enough programming experience. Mm -hmm. So the course has been redesigned, and I don't know if you know the structure take courses, but most, uh, let's take for example, step four, they have to do 11 uh, units, uh, of which six are composed of uh, um, mandatory, uh, sorry, it turns out to be better, so a core, core units of five <laughs> lectures, but we don't let them have the choice. <laughs> we tell them we will only teach certain units, and this coming year, we've got three new courses being rolled out, and I can tell you now that all three levels are getting, um, so, okay, so for an um, associate diploma in Python, scripting, mm -hmm. and but so three are getting database units, because mm -hmm. we've got far too many students who do not have the strength in maths to do survey. And uh, so, it really was amazing listening to this, what you, your experience at graduate level, because mm -hmm. we're actually getting it at 16, 17, and 18 year olds. Yeah. And so, hopefully, our students who occasionally feed into not new tests but USQ mm -hmm. um, matriculation are now going to become best prepared for those courses because it's, it is definitely noticeable in our students as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know how many um, uh, um, Mike feels uh, typical of his students. That, I, I can very highly with what you said that, um, yeah. that we need to be software agnostic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's what we try to do over a very long period in earth sciences. Mm -hmm. We have to try to type it with particular packages. Um, we not so much with or in geophysics units. Before CAN last year, we had we had lots of Python programming mm -hmm. and stuff, and we utilised a range of open source software for that. So I, I concur entirely. I've been. I've been critical in the past of your discipline at UTAS in teaching GIS stuff because it was mm -hmm. very much followed this recipe. Yes. And I've, and I've watched the students and if they can have the recipe, they can know it. Mm, yes, yeah. exactly. So, um, yeah, we tried not to make it that way in this. But, but also, can I just say, it's very hard when a company like Ezra and um, Pimbo's try to follow that info. Are presented universities with free yes. licenses. <laughs> and that is, this, this was my biggest argument when I first joined Tate, was that yeah. our students should not be encouraged to take student licenses in either mm -hmm. Arc, 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 or MacInfo, because then when they went into a workplace that didn't have mm -hmm. that software, what were they going to use? And finally, this year, um, I was actually um, endorsed in, in fact, we did all our cert three, cert four um, surveyor students have been encouraged to take huge licenses for just that reason. Because many of them will go to work for a small survey company that 
cannot afford the massive license costs. And that and then they also have so much more mm -hmm. resources available and by doing that, you know, GIS exchange and so on is, is such a great um, a platform asking questions again and answers well. Sorry, I, I saw some hands go up. Yes, yes. 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 Um do you think any community groups like that focus on programming uh, mm -hmm. will have a role to play in these? Oh, like, definitely. For example, here at IMAS, we have Faith with us, which mm -hmm. does this programming stuff. Mm -hmm. So we are actually having trouble trying to attract people from my like, undergraduate. Uh, right. Okay. So I will vlog it very yes. hard in my unit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she does have brochures because I asked that because I did say people could bring merchandise, but there is a uh, a four page. Yeah, we have a website. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can find us in the program or sure. social media. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, I'm familiar with what you guys do. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I'm very happy to, to, to mm -hmm. bring that up with students. And we have had students express interest in, in learning how to program and asking questions about, you know, how do I extend on what I've seen in this unit? Um, so it's really great to know that there is a community group there for them to join. And I would definitely refer people on. I think we also use it um, within environment if they need. Yes. Um, so which is a structured mm -hmm. object um, or a type language yes. uh, which is much easier and stuff like that. But I always um when you know like we work with just whatever, I always start in the first principle that you get over the of those algorithms and put put the different building blocks together, have a small predetermined data set yes. that you actually right. link yes. and validate what you're actually doing. And a lot of people don't don't get that connection to do that. Well, in some cases, I would use the entire data, so mm -hmm. we use a lot of things, and it just complicates so getting out and trying to find things that find unusual results. Well, uh, you can't, you, 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 need to, you need to limit the amount of data mm -hmm. that each one of those is actually okay. speeding up, but it's supposed to speak out the writers, or even if you're actually writing in the part of the universe, mm -hmm. exactly that you're getting the result anticipated from those specific data sets that you'll be working on, but with limited information with specific errors deliberately placed in there to basically mm -hmm. pre predicting sort of the a, a, a results out of the, you know, and getting into that mindset mm -hmm. of the building systems in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's definitely something that I know that we do in our remote sensing in particular is that I have built broken data sets to teach people how to fix them. <laughs> so yeah, so that's a very good point. I think um, as our what we like, the way we try to introduce a program is that if you've got to do a task more than once, you need to learn how to do a script. <laughs> and, and it's amazing how just that simple step actually suddenly makes sense to you. That rather than just uh, repeat something, it's, it's like the old map basic script at the bottom of the, the, the mapping fell in the, is when you've done, uh, actually got it to work once, um, if you look at what the code was, then you can actually do a, a loop. And, and it's, Coding. Oh my god! <laughs> it was very exciting, mm -hmm. as you can tell. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. Do we have time? Sorry, I might ask a quick question. Um, yeah, sure. So, when I, I did a few GIS remote sensing units, which has back eight years ago, and then they can use every stuff, which upset me a lot. Um, we still do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very continued. We still do. I mean, yeah. How do you. How do you I was going to, not force is not the wrong word, but how do you encourage educators to use open source software and yeah. force code? It's really hard, um, and it definitely takes a concerted effort. So at the moment, um, we're going into a period of proof and review where we've realised that the way that we're teaching isn't necessarily the best way that we teach. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at, is, is the software that we're teaching the most appropriate software? And is it the software that's going to serve our students best? Um, so we have introduced some um, introductory tutorials um, using QGIS um, and our third year unit um, in GIS in particular relies very heavily on Python scripting. Um, so they are part of our curriculum but they're not as large a part as I personally would like them to be. Um, so yeah, um, so just for the group, as, as we are doing a curriculum review, if any of you would like to input into the curriculum review, um, we'll be putting out a call um, later in the year where you can provide suggestions of things that you would like to see our graduates able to do and the skills and the software that you would like them to be used. <laughs> so yes, Nick, if you would like to give us a long list of things, we'll be more than happy. Just make that a big one. Well, just one. Oh, just one. Open thoughts. All of our thoughts. Your expression is agnosticism. 
Yes. And, and I, um, I, I just say it's a dot software centric. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, that's an obvious thing. Um, open minded about your software platform because you immediately disadvantage a student who goes into a workplace where they are not familiar with the software. It creates undue stress on them as well. <laughs> I mean, I would say in the ideal world, you can eat, like, if there's enough time that kicks both in the pot. Yeah, um, and there's this, like, time to go, if it's a pot. Yeah, and what we have, and sadly, what we have to do, because we do get students from set four up who are in a workplace using a pot. So, in our MS, um, Microsoft Teams sessions for teachers, they demonstrate in one package and they record in the other package. Mm -hmm. So that students actually have available two videos. All the time, actually showing it's exactly the same task repeated in both packages, and that's why we've had to go a little bit away from that because there are so few users of it now, and it took up so much time to actually prepare those resources. Mm -hmm. So we just do our pro and um, So I yeah. guess just to add on to that, if, what I find is that if you teach people what the name of the actual algorithm is and what the actual process is and what goes in. Yeah. They can just Google the algorithm and figure out how to do it in, in the other software. Yeah. Kind of thing. yeah. But that in itself is quite difficult to teach people to do. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely something that we need to improve uh, and we are working We have a glossary. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. We have to. Because we speak, um, so categorization, thematicization. I've, I've always used it as a thematic. I had to learn that you don't apply thematics in from uh, the computer sense categorization. So we've just developed a table where um, the teachers can input into uh, what the equivalence term is. Um, to um, it's a, all right, I'll stop talking now.